So thank you, Anka, for the very nice introduction. So let me uh, first start sharing the screen. Uh, OK, so I guess everybody now sees my, my screens. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. So I mean, thanks for, uh, for inviting me to give this talk. And it's very exciting that uh, there is a vector commitment uh, research day, definitely something that I uh, could not imagine like 10 years ago when we wrote this paper. Um, so yeah, so my goal today uh, is to uh, take you on a journey in uh, to discover uh, what vector commitments are and in which planets they live and what they can do. Okay, so um, so I, I, let me start straight. So I, I don't know exactly who the audience is, unfortunately. So I I mean my talk is uh, is start from the basics. Okay, so. Um, Hopefully, it's going to be useful uh, to everyone. Okay, so let's start with, uh, um, with about commitments. So, what commitments are? So, commitment is this fun fundamental uh, cryptographic primitive um, that allows a user that here in the slide it's uh, the user Alice uh, to uh, commit to a message. So, this is like the digital equivalent of a sealed envelope. So, Alice puts the message in the envelope and gives this. Uh, envelope to Bob. And then um, at a later point, uh, there is the opening phase. And the opening phase, essentially, it's like opening the envelope, and Bob will see this message. So what do we want from commitments? So there are two very basic uh, properties that we uh, wish. One is hiding. So essentially, this says that, look, the, the envelope is opaque. You cannot see the message until the point you open it. And then the second property is binding and says that uh, once Alice puts the message in the envelope, she cannot uh, change her mind about what is there, right? So it's impossible that at some point she makes a magic trick and uh, shows that inside the envelope there is uh, both M and M prime. So only one message is inside. All right, so uh, now what are vector commitments? Okay, um, so this is a notion that uh, was implicit in some uh, previous work by Libera and Jung in, uh, from TCC 2010, and also some even previous work, as I will detail later, from um, uh, Dario Catalano, myself, and Maria Grazia Messina from 2008. Um, so this is an extension of, uh, uh, of commitment scheme in which uh, what we now commit are vectors, right? So it's not just any message, but it's a, it's a vector. So it's a uh, uh, sequence of elements, let's see, an ordered sequence of elements, V1, V2, Vn. And uh, we want to put the vector in the commitment, so in this envelope, give it to Bob. But then the crucial, one crucial property we want is that we would like to open the commitment only at selected positions. So uh, instead of opening the envelope in full, we would like to open just a little uh, all in this envelope and show, look, at the position i, there is value vi. Um, now, and, and the, on the other end, uh, we would like the uh, um, Bob, the verifier, to check that this is true. So given the commitment, given the index i, value vi, and uh, some opening proof vi, by i, uh, like Bob should be convinced that really inside uh, the commitment, the position i, there is vi. All right, so what are the key properties of commitment or vector commitments? Because until now we could just say, look, these are just commitments for a li larger message space. So the first uh, key property of vector commitment is um, position binding. So um, position binding essentially says that you cannot open the same position at two different values. So if we want to be a bit more formal, uh, we are uh, saying that given the parameters of the commitment, it is computationally hard to come up with a commitment and two opening proofs for the same position and two different values. So uh, in particular, it means that you cannot uh, find uh, a commitment C at position I and two values V I and V prime I that are different and two uh, opening proofs that uh, both are accepted. Okay, so um, that's the, essentially the basic security property. And I, um, one thing I want to remark is that for vector commitments, and at, at least in this talk, I will not focus on uh, any ID property, okay? 
as in particular, I mean, it's not uh, so crucial in, in many applications. So the other property that makes um, vector commitment uh, um, like uh, a non-trivial and interesting property is conciseness. So what does it mean? So it means that the size of the commitment and the size of the opening uh, proofs is independent of the vector length. So more precisely, this means that there is some fixed polynomial in the security parameter that says that like the commitments uh, value and each opening have, are bounded by this size, so this P of lambda. Okay, so you can think of really concretely, it's going to be, let's say, one or two group elements um, for these values, regardless of the uh, length of the vector. All right, so, uh, and then, all right, yeah, this is the main difference with the, uh, with Merkle tree. So, uh, Merkle trees, uh, which is this uh, very popular cryptographic construction by uh, Merkle, uh, can be seen as vector commitments, but with the crucial difference that in that case, the size of the proof is logarithmic in the length of the vector. Okay, so in the, when we uh, came up with this idea of vector commitments, we wanted to get something more ambitious in which openings can be of constant size, essentially. Okay, so this is a summary, like uh, more, uh, um, a summary of the formal notion of vector commitment. So it, it's essentially, it's, uh, uh, it consists of uh, four algorithms. There is a setup algorithm that given the um, security parameter and the bound on the vector length, uh, it produces some public parameters. And with these parameters, you can commit to a vector uh, using the commitment algorithm. You can uh, create an opening for position I, and you can uh, verify this, uh, this opening. We want, of course, these algorithms to preserve correctness. So if you create an opening uh, honestly and, and also a commitment, the, the verification should accept. Uh, we have conciseness, which is what I uh, define in position binding as well. All right, so um, now that I uh, introduce what, uh, you know, at least what vector commitments are, uh, my journey starts with applications. Okay, so I want to, um, mention like uh, some basic applications that uh, motivate why vector commitments are useful. And uh, also, I mean, I did not say that um, if you have questions during the talk, please uh, ask them and write them uh, on the chat. And uh, uh, I think Anka will redirect them to me. And in particular, if there are questions of something that is not clear in between, uh, I'd be happy to take them uh, leave because uh, I mean, we don't have to wait the end of the talk to clarify some things. Okay, so um, the first application of um, vector commitments that I want to uh, present is something that is not um, very popular, but I want to mention it because it's actually the application why we came out with this, uh, with this notion. And so I'm not going to give a lot of details, but I think it's an interesting story, even if uh, we don't get too, uh, too deep on it. So this application is the notion of zero knowledge sets. Um, that is a cryptographic primitive proposed by Nikali, Rabin, and Kielan in 2003 that allows a prover uh, or a party in general to commit to uh, a set S and to prove in zero knowledge that uh, some element X is in the set or that some element is not in the set. And if you wonder how different this is from accumulators, for example, um, the main difference is that uh, in zero knowledge sets, you want to hide even the size of the set and you want to hide even an upper bound on the size of the set. Okay, so um, now uh, when we look at this problem, um, we look at the state of the art and the state of the art was where this construction by Nikali, Rabin and Hill and also some generalization by uh, Chase et al. In which they um, were constructing zero knowledge sets by using some specific construction of uh, sparse Merkle trees. And in particular, these were Merkle trees of commitments in which uh, uh, the commitment were Mercurial commitments. So I'm not going to say what Mercurial commitments are, but Roughly, they are commitments of, that come in two modes, uh, like art, art commitment and soft commitment. And the idea was to um, place the set as the leaves of the tree, and then to build the Merkle tree bottom up, but in such a way that when there were elements that 
uh, were not in the in the in the set, or there were some part of the universe that was completely empty. You were building uh, only the root of the subtree of this missing element. So it's, this is the this um, for example the C11 soft commission that you have there. Now, when you had to uh, create a, a membership or non-membership proof, the problem was that these opening proofs were uh, linear in the age of the tree, which essentially was uh, some, uh, for example, some integer scale. So, uh, okay. So, right. So, in this uh, paper from with Dario Catalano and Maria Grazia Messina from uh, Europe 2008, uh, when we look at this problem, uh, we ask the following question, like, can we make these zero knowledge set trees shallow? Like, you know, can we reduce the proof length by uh, using, instead of using a two to one commitment, to use an n to one commitment? Because if that was possible, we could have reduced the uh, size of opening proofs from uh, k, which was actually the log in base two of two to the k, to a log in base n of two to the k, by essentially increasing the, the branching factor. And you know, maybe it's interesting, like th this actual question was uh, originally came from Dario Catalano, was finding some connection between uh, uh, this problem of zero less sets and the, the problem of uh, uh, three base uh, digital signatures. So, mm, right, so in, uh, what we did in, in our paper was to then define this notion of a, a, what we call uh, n trapdoor mercurial commitment, which was this uh, commitment for uh, for vector, but it was a mercurial commitment, um, and uh, that should have this property of having uh, uh, short proofs. But in our first paper from 2008, we only realized uh, constant size soft openings, but we had linear uh, size hard openings, so it was not a full uh, solution. So uh, later, uh, Libert and Jung in 2010 uh, came out with the first realization of a n trapdoor mercurial commitment with constant size uh, uh, openings from based on the, the Andy Fieldman assumption over pairings. So essentially, this was the, the very first construction uh, it, that implicitly was a vector commitment. And later, uh, we formalized this notion. We kind of recognized that there was something more fundamental in this idea of committing to, uh, to vectors and uh, uh, having uh, short proofs. And in particular, something that was much beyond the, the idea of doing mercurial commitments. So in this paper from 2000, in, that we published in 2013, we formalized the idea of vector commitments. And we proposed two constructions uh, now based on standard assumptions, such as RSA and CDH over pairing. And it's uh, quite interesting that shallow Merkle trees today are also known as vertical trees, and it's becoming a popular uh, uh, idea. So, I mean, with this application, it, this was a kind of interesting lesson for me about the importance of theoretical and foundational research, because like the idea of coming up with this notion of vector commitment came from a purely uh, theoretical question that uh, we asked ourselves. Okay, so let's now go and uh, talk about another application of vector commitments uh, to something much more maybe relevant to uh, actually Filecoin and, and Protocol Labs for us, um, which is the problem of outsourced storage. So let's consider here uh, this user Bob um, that has a large data set and wants to outsource the storage of this data set uh, to a cloud server, right? But uh, at some point, I mean, Bob doesn't have space for it, so he's going to delete the data. But at some point, you want to you want to know if the cloud is still storing this data. And how can this be solved? So in the trivial solution would be that look, the cloud, I mean, Bob would store the ash of the data, and then the cloud to convince the Bob uh, uh, that he still has the data, he would send the data back to it. But that's, of course, like, you know, it's too much, too much communication. If every time you have to, you want to make this, um, check, you have to transfer this data, you know, no, you know, it cannot scale. So um, this problem can actually, um, uh, was addressed by the notion of proof or retrievability. Um, it was considered by Guels and Kaliski in 2007. Um, and uh, they came up with the, uh, a construction for proof or retrievability uh, using Merkle trees. And this construction it was actually generalized to vector commitments by Ben Fish in 2018. And that's what I'm going to present now. 
So um, the idea is that uh, the uh, the data so can be seen as a as a vector in which each entry of the vector is a is a is a block. So think of a file that you divide it in, into blocks of a fixed length. And um, now using a vector commitment, Bob can commit to this vector and then now send the vector back to uh, you can send the vector to the cloud, and it deletes it from from its memory. Um, then when uh, Bob wants to uh, check that the cloud is still storing the data, the idea is that he would select some uh, uh, subset of positions, uh, each chosen at random. Let's say he chooses uh, K random positions and ask the, um, the cloud, can you please send me the data at these positions? So now the cloud would come out with the, so would send the data, so VR1, VRK, and for each of these uh, uh, data blocks, it would also uh, give the opening proof. Now, uh, and that is that by selecting k, this integer k to be roughly uh, the security parameter or in some uh, you know, appropriate way that I'm going to discuss in this talk, uh, this is a secure way to check that uh, the cloud is not deleting uh, the data, at least you know, it, it is storing a, a quite large fraction of, uh, of it uh, with high probability. Now, what is crucial and why this uh, um, construction is, uh, achieves the goal is that now the uh, communication uh, complexity of this protocol is uh, linear in the uh, number k of positions that we ask. And in particular, it only requires to send uh, k times size of the proof b. So if the opening proof is, is short, uh, in the case of, for example, it could be log n if it was the, vector, uh, the Merkle tree, or if it is of a fixed size, we are happy because now the, um, the communication complexity of this protocol is very short. All right, so um, let me summarize. So I uh, described two applications uh, so far uh, that motivates vector commitment. The first is quite theoretical and it's actually the, the um, application motivated uh, why vector commitments were formed, so why we came up with this idea. And uh, it's quite interesting that nowadays it's gaining traction as also as a practical application if you think of um, using uh, vector commitment as a way to make uh, shallow Merkle trees. And it's something that is being considered, for example, by Ethereum for uh, future updates. Um, in terms of uh, proof of storage, uh, I mean, this is a purely, I mean, it's a practical uh, application. It's motivated by source storage and is something, for example, is in the interest of, um, of Filecoin because it's a core part of their protocol, even if with some, uh, with some differences. It's not exactly what I presented. Uh, but there are more applications of vector commitments, for example, verifiable databases. Uh, you, you can use them to construct accumulators, uh, stateless blockchains, which is also a more uh, modern application that maybe uh, some of the talks today will mention it. And also succeed arguments is, uh, is, uh, is another application. So to take on messages uh, from this part of the talk, um, I think, uh, I mean, at least a, a lesson for me is that what's the importance of theory motivated research questions? Like sometimes you have to think blue sky without having uh, in mind uh, very concrete things and it, you, know, you can come up with very original uh, ideas. And uh, also the importance of practice motivated research questions, because as I'm going to show in the next slides, uh, then application further motivate exploration of, uh, of new ideas. Okay, so that's where we are in our journey. And um, I'm going now to discuss what are some additional properties of vector commitments, such as updatability of vector openings and aggregation. And now uh, these, all these properties are actually motivated by uh, concrete applications. And then I'll move to discuss uh, state of the art. So actually, if you have questions on this part, it's a good moment also to, to interrupt. Okay. Um, so I see something in the chat. Ah, okay. That's the next one. So the um, right. So let's look back at the uh, outsource storage uh, application. No. So we made our verifier happy, right? So we now can uh, outsource um, 
the uh, its file and uh, you can check that uh, the cloud is storing it and communication is very short, its storage is very short. So verify is empty. But uh, when we are in outsource storage, it can actually happen that you want to modify the data you outsource, right? So then what do you do, right? Because the, the, uh, in order to modify, if Bob wants to modify the data, but he does not have any more the data, in order to continue with this protocol, we should recompute the commitment to the uh, new version of the data, but it cannot because it doesn't have the vector V. So, so these are uh, uh, application and you know, similar ones uh, motivate the uh, notion of uh, updatable vector commitments. So this is something that we introduced already in the uh, um, CF13 paper. And uh, an updatable vector commitment is a vector commitment, so that has the same algorithm as the one uh, I defined, um, that, however, admits the following additional algorithms. First, uh, it should have a, an update commitment algorithm that, uh, given the public parameters, given the commitment, a position I, and the uh, old and new value at this position. So VI is the value that is supposed to be in the commit, uh, committed at position I and V prime I is the value that we would like to uh, overwrite in that position. And possibly given the opening proof for position I, this update com algorithm produce a new commitment C prime. And C prime is essentially should be a commitment to the vector where at position I, instead of having VI, you have C prime I. So, and then also you want an update open algorithm. So this is an algorithm that um, can update an opening proof at position J, um, given an update at position I. Now, J and I could be the same, but they may not be the same. So, and the idea is that if there, uh, now the, uh, you know, the update opening algorithm should be produce an updated uh, opening proof pi prime J, and this should be now valid for C prime. So now the problem is if you recognize is that if um, C changes and you add a pre-existing opening proof for the old commitment, this opening proof would no longer be valid for the new commitment. So this update open algorithm is a, uh, essentially allows to update uh, the, the opening proof. And um, notice that the, what makes these algorithm, algorithms interesting and non-trivial is the fact that they can be executed without knowing the entire vector, right? So you don't have to compute things from scratch. You can just have this local, very local information about the updated position I in order to uh, produce the updated values. And uh, based on the fact of whether this phi I values is needed or not, we actually can recognize two updatability models. So if phi I is not needed, uh, we can simply say that the vector commitment is updatable. And this is actually the notion that we um, introduced in our, uh, in our paper in, in 2013. Uh, but some other uh, more recent works also consider the case in which uh, when you want to update at something, at, you know, when there is an updated position I, you want to update a commitment or another proof, you may need to know the opening at position I. And in this case, we say that uh, the vector commitment is interpretable. At least it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a name that I came up with. Some other things, some other paper use a different name for this. Okay, so uh, in some sense, like, of course, like the, the first model is a bit more, uh, more powerful because it requires uh, less information and possibly less interaction. So now uh, what, you know, it's very easy to see that, uh, um, with updatable vector commitments, we can now support updates in, in the outsource storage because when uh, Bob wants to change a value at position I, he would just run locally the update com algorithm in order to have the new commitment C prime. And then you would ask simply, would simply tell the, uh, the cloud to uh, what is the update information and then the cloud would also run update commitment on its side.
And okay, in this application, updating openings is maybe not crucial, uh, but you know, I, I want to keep it simple. And uh, uh, there are other applications, for example, decentralized storage, in which maybe other users are holding uh, uh, opening crews at different positions that they may be interested to, uh, to update their openings. Okay, so uh, that was about updatable uh, vector commitments. Uh, again, let's look at this uh, outsource storage application. And uh, we are going to ask another question about whether the protocol that we currently have is really optimal. And um, in fact, right now, we're seeing that the communication complexity for each check uh, is uh, order of K times size of the proof. Uh, and this is due to the fact that we have to send, in addition to the data, one proof for every position. And um, one interesting question is whether it's really needed to send all these K proofs, and if we can avoid to send all of them. So, um, so this idea and, uh, motivates the notion of uh, vector commitments with sub-vector openings. So this is a notion that was introduced by um, Bonnet, Boons, and Fish in 2019, and also Lai and Malavolta in the same year, uh, motivated by slightly different applications, but with the similar um, with the similar motivation. So the uh, the idea of sub vector openings is that um, instead of opening um, the vector at single positions, you can directly open uh, the um, the vector at at set of n positions. So now you, you know, the input of the opening algorithm is a, uh, is a set of indices, i1, im. And uh, it, the output is a, is a proof pi, uh, pi i. So it's capital I for, for this set. And um, analogously, like the uh, verification algorithm has to work now with the sub vector bi and with the set of indices um, capital I. What of course makes this uh, um, you know, extend, extended notion useful is the fact that the size of the proof is independent, not only of the length of the vector, but also is independent of the uh, size of the uh, subset of position you are opening it. So it's still essentially a fixed um, polynomial in the security parameter. Now, if we have uh, vector commitments with uh, subvector openings in our ends, then it's quite easy uh, to see how to use them to uh, optimize the communication complexity of this uh, proof of retrievability uh, protocol. Uh, because now the, uh, um, the cloud, instead of coming up, coming up with the proof for every position that it is requested to open, you can simply create this uh, batch proof for uh, all the k positions. So, and what it needs to send is uh, k, you know, something like k bits, or let's say k si times size of the block, probably I should have written here, plus one um, um, one proof, right? The length of one proof. So, it, it, what is interesting is that, like, the uh, security parameter is only um, you know inside the length of the proof and not in the uh, perhaps in the size of the blocks. Okay, so um, that's uh, you know the the motivation for some uh, uh, basic properties of, uh, of I mean actually a bit more than basic properties of uh, vector commitments such as updatability and sub vector openings. So now I want to discuss uh, another property that is called aggregation, and uh, to understand why we need aggregation, let's again, look at the um, proof of retrievability uh, protocol. And in particular, let's look at efficiency. So, so far we have uh, worked uh, to make our verifier very active, right? So yes, show storage, communication, we kind of optimize it to be, uh, you know, K plus a size of uh, a single proof. But how is the life for the prover? I mean, we always make, you know, talk about succinctness and uh, we make our verifiers happy, but the, the prover is also concerned with efficiency. And unfortunately, the, it, it has a tough life, um, especially if we look at the um, vector commitments construction that have constant size openings. Uh, there is a huge problem there. And the problem is that when, uh, 
the uh, cloud in this case, in this application, has to execute the opening algorithm, the running time of this opening algorithm is uh, strictly linear in the uh, length of the vector. And more uh, uh, critically, it, is, it requires a linear number of public key operations, like group exponentiation, for example. So this is very expensive in practice if you have to uh, run this with very large, uh, very large data. So uh, motivated by this, um, by this problem, we uh, uh, came up with this idea of aggregating, uh, aggregating proofs, and in particular, to use them uh, to solve this problem. So first of all, what is aggregation? So uh, aggregation is, um, uh, so it's a, it's a property that says that, assume that you have uh, one opening for each position. So you have a vector and you have an opening by one, by two, by n for every element of the vector. With aggregation, what you can do is to um, publicly take these opening proofs and you can aggregate them, right? In the sense that now you can create a subvector opening proof for, uh, for example, for position one and two by only knowing the opening proofs for position one and position two. And what are they also their, uh, the opening values? So, uh, in particular, uh, and also even more in general, it's not only about merging proofs for uh, one, um, you know, for two for two single positions, but also about uh, merging uh, subvector openings for uh, different subsets i and j. Now, what are the key properties that the, can be computed without knowing the rest of the vector? So you only know what uh, the um, these sort of local openings. And uh, the um, sides of the opening proofs uh, that you start uh, from and that you obtain from aggregation is still fixed. Um, okay, so what can we do with, uh, with aggregation? So in this um, paper that we published at Asia Free 2020, uh, uh, together with uh, um, uh, Matteo Campanelli, Dimitris Colonello, Smigola Grego, and Luca Nistardo, we uh, came up with this idea of uh, using it to speed up the opening. So the idea is that um, when is, uh, so the prover could execute a pre-computation phase in which he would compute an opening proof for every position and he would store all these openings. Now, whenever it is asked to uh, create an opening for uh, some, for example, a random subset of positions. In this example, let's say it's uh, position two and position i. You would then use the aggregation algorithm to uh, aggregate the proof, and uh, and then to send the aggregated proof to the to the verifier. Now the the uh, nice thing is that uh, after the, the precomputation, the open the online opening costs can be constant or you know, let's say it's linear in the number of positions that uh, it is asked to open. But uh, actually we have to also consider the cost of pre-computation and here the observation is that if you can manage to um, uh, have a, a pre-computation of all these openings in for example quasi-linear time like n log n, then we can say that the amortized cost uh, per, uh, per opening in the, of the fast opening is uh, logarithmic. Um, but of course here, I'm, what I am not maybe stressing about is that uh, this requires uh, storage, auxiliary storage, right? So uh, because uh, in order to produce this, um, having to this fast opening, the, um, the, uh, the prover needs these uh, uh, end proofs to be stored. Now, there are two questions that we can ask um, at this point. So first, is it guaranteed that we can do this, uh, compute these uh, opening proofs in n log n time? And that's not trivial because like, um, if you have to execute, uh, compute them using the traditional open algorithm that was requiring n uh, O of n time, then this might trivially require O of n square, and which is not, then we, it wouldn't give us uh, any amortized cost. And the uh, second question is whether uh, we can do better in terms of auxiliary storage because storing like n proofs can be a lot, uh, especially in, in some construction where maybe like each proof is a, uh, an hidden order group uh, element. 
So, um, and to uh, address these two questions, uh, in this paper, we uh, actually went further and introduced the notion of incremental aggregation. So incremental aggregation is what the, the, this word says. So essentially is, is the idea that uh, you can keep aggregating things an unbounded number of times. So uh, you can start from proofs for single element, you can aggregate pairs, you can then uh, keep aggregating until you want. And at the same time, you all, we also uh, want this incremental aggregation to work in the, in the opposite sense, in the sense that we uh, should be able to uh, disaggregate truths. So if we have a subvector uh, opening truths for, for example, position two, three, five, six, eight, we may want to extract a, a subvector opening for uh, a subset of of those positions. And again, we may want to do this an unbounded number of times up to reaching uh, proof for single, uh, single values. Okay, so um, with incremental aggregation, uh, we can uh, do, so we can actually improve the, uh, this application of uh, increasing uh, op online opening time. So how can we do this? So, um, the, uh, the idea is that uh, in the, in the pre-computation phase, instead of computing one proof per, per element, we can now compute um, a proof for every, uh, uh, for chunks of elements. So we divide the, the, um, um, the vector in chunks. So instead of uh, just a single position, for example, we can create, um, we can pre-compute a proof for every pair of elements. So one for one, two, one for three, four, one for uh, five, six, and so on and so forth. And, um, and then what you have to do when you are requested to create the opening for some position, you would first disaggregate, let's say it's position two and nine. So we, you would first use disaggregation to um, extract the relevant uh, single position that you, uh, that you need. For example, you want to extract pi two from pi one, two pi i from pi i and i plus one. And, uh, and then you use aggregation uh, in order to put them together and send a single proof. So as you can see, this is a case where you would need to use um, like aggregation and disaggregation in an interchangeable way. And um, the, the nice thing is that now the um, uh, size of the storage that you need is, is like, uh, n over b proofs for some integer b that you can flexibly choose, uh, essentially which tells you how many, um, uh, uh, like how many um, chunks you are you are creating, and the uh, online uh, um, opening time is b log x. So uh, now it's essentially you have a, you can achieve uh, a lot of trade-offs according to how you want to choose b. If you want to minimize storage and or you want to prefer uh, faster uh, opening time. But there is something that I have not uh, discussed so far, which is uh, again, like uh, the online opening cost is profitable if we can uh, amortize the pre-computation. And uh, what's the guarantee that we can pre-compute proofs in and log n time? And uh, a very interesting um, uh, you know, result we came up with is that if you have incremental aggregation, this property alone uh, allows to argue that you can obtain uh, a quasi linear pre-computation. So uh, I will not enter in the details of, of this result, but the idea is that um, if, incre in, if uh, uh, disaggregation is actually incremental, you can uh, uh, compute disaggregation in a divide in a divide and conquer uh, uh, manner in in a uh, in a tree uh, in a tree fashion. So and this is, allows you to obtain like uh, I mean actually that's what what you have like the, to have uh, n log n uh, pre computation time. So Anka, if you want to ask a question, it's a good. Um, yeah, uh, there is a question in in the chat. Um, so don't you need to calculate the PII plus one proof in ON for the disaggregation? Uh, um, Felix, if you want to clarify more about the question. Right. Um, so 
you mean uh, okay if the question is before aggregation um... so for the disaggregation what's the um, the computation effort I so, guess. right so the idea is that the um Right, it's actually what is in the statement of the theorem. Like what, in, uh, what you want is that the running time of disaggregation is linear, strictly linear in the size of the uh, subset uh, of, the, uh, of the proof you are uh, starting from. So if you want to disaggregate the subvector opening of, for a set of sides K, the disaggregate algorithm should take uh, order of K time. Um, so, Phi i i plus one is a, for example, is an opening of a set of sites two. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but mm -hmm. the and the idea, I mean, maybe I can give this. This also helps me to give a more intuition about how of this theorem is that you can compute once a subvector opening for the entire vector, right? So it's it's a legitimate subvector opening, like the sort of a phi one two n, and this would cost you linear time. You compute it. You compute this once. And then you can disaggregate this in a uh, divide and conquer manner uh, by essentially uh, extracting all the single values from these uh, uh, large subvector openings. So that's the idea of, it, of this uh, uh, quasi linear pre computation. And the idea is that you start from something that has, uh, would have cost order of n to disaggregate, and then you, uh, in the next step, is order of n over two, and then order of n over four, and so on. But so if you're interested in it, I, I really uh, advise you to, to look at our uh, Asia 2020 paper. OK, so uh, now it's time to uh, look at the state of the art. Um, so we have look at the application. So I'll, uh, um, now I want to tell you what do we know about uh, realizations of vector commitments with all these, uh, um, all these properties. And, uh, Right, so on this, we are going to look at the planets of vector commitments that in our case, the planets are uh, uh, like different planets where different assumptions hold. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a bit of this, uh, you know, how we can classify the existing construction. So first of all, uh, okay, I have to, a disclaimer is that in my uh, state of the art, um, at least here, I'm only considering uh, vector commitments with constant size opening proofs and not with logarithmic openings, except for lattice based and, and uh, uh, Merkle trees, uh, because I think it's, it's very interesting to, uh, to mention that. So, okay, we have the planet of collision resistant ash functions, and we know that Merkle trees are there, and we can see them as uh, um, uh, like uh, vector commitments with logarithmic size opening. And then I already mentioned that uh, even before uh, we formalized this notion, there were uh, two constructions. Actually, one is the one by Libert and Jung that uh, was this uh, trapdoor mercurial commitment, um, from in which implicitly there was a vector commitment. And the other one is actually this uh, very uh, um, celebrated paper by now, which is the uh, Kate Zaveruska Goldberg uh, polynomial commitment, that was a polynomial commitment based on pairings. And using polynomial commitments, you, we can easily construct uh, vector commitments by essentially creating the polynomial that interpolates the vector. Uh, so um, both these uh, schemes existed prior to this, uh, to the formalization of, of this notion and would yield constant size openings. Uh, and they were both based on uh, n-type assumptions over pairings. So uh, with our... Uh, uh, with our work, I mean, besides the formalization, we actually came out with the uh, first constructions that were based on standard assumptions. One was based on the, um, the uh, RSA assumption, and the other one was based on CDH over uh, pairing groups. And uh, again, this now shows that also we, we knew we know uh, vector commitments over the planet of groups of unknown order, right? Um, Okay, so and, uh, uh, in 2013, there is also another paper by um, Papamantu, Shi, um, Tamasi, and uh, okay, I don't remember the last order of uh, apologies for that, um, that proposed a vector commitment based on lattices. And it's based on SIS assumption. 
And uh, this commitment has uh, polylogarithmic size openings. Uh, but I think it's interesting to mention it uh, because uh, uh, one interesting property that has compared to Merkle trees is that it's fully updatable, right? So that's a nice, uh, nice property that makes it, uh, let's say, non-trivial um, uh, construction. Because otherwise, we can, of course, instantiate Merkle trees with lattice space as function. Okay, so then there was a really for a, a number of years there was no much. Uh, um, you know, not many results on vector commitments. Uh, but then in 2019, Lion um, Malavolta and also Bonnet, Bunt, and Fish came up with this idea of uh, vector commitments with sub vector openings. And in particular, um, Lion Malavolta proposed uh, a construction uh, that essentially extends our CF13 uh, scheme based on RSA and also our uh, another construction that extends our um, uh, CDH based scheme. With the interesting property that uh, you can obtain sub vector openings. And I'm drawing these you know, dashed uh, uh, borders to show that they are essentially in the same family. And in particular, all these things that we are going to see are within a few number of families. They're, they're not very diverse. Um, OK, so that's with sub vector openings. And, um, in 2020, we uh, published this paper where we propose actually two constructions, both based on groups of unknown order, and uh, both have this incremental aggregation property. Um, and uh, in particular, one of them, however, is only hint updatable, and the other one is not updatable at all. Um, uh, so, and uh, uh, again, the, what I uh, that as a uh, number two scheme uh, in our paper, it's uh, a scheme that essentially extends the line on a uh, construction to obtain incremental aggregation, but also to obtain constant size public parameters, which was an open problem. And um, in the, the first scheme, instead is a, in another family that I would call like accumulator based constructions or RSA accumulator based constructions. And it's somehow similar to the BBF19 scheme, even if not uh, exactly, um, you know, I mean, it, is, it, it shares some similarities with this. Um, okay, so in uh, the same year, there were other works that were extending uh, these constructions based on pairings in order to achieve aggregation and so also sub vector openings. So there is this paper by uh, Tomescu et al, published at SCN 2020, that shows how to obtain aggregation for. Uh, polynomial uh, commitments, and another paper by Gorbunov et al, also known as point proofs, that uh, shows how to uh, make the libert jung vector commitment um, uh, essentially with uh, sub-vector openings and also with the one-op aggregation. And the more uh, recent paper is the uh, one by Agraval et al, uh, from actually 2020, that uh, also known as KBAC, uh, as a key value um, uh, map commitment, that uh, is, uh, is updatable and has uh, sub vector openings, and is, uh, it has also only one of aggregation. What is interesting there is that it's updatable with uh, constant size parameters. So in some it sort of improves over um, our second construction. And also another interesting thing is that they obtain this property by sort of using together both approaches uh, from based on CF13 and accumulators. And uh, probably the last work in this, uh, in this research line is the very recent work by uh, Piker that all that showed a lattice-based uh, vector commitment. Um, and again, this is polylogarithmic size openings and, um, and is based on the SIS assumption. And again, it's interest, what is interesting about this construction is that it's updatable. Okay, so I could be more precise about the state of the art and I'm going to skip this use table for now, but it, um, it's interesting also to see the different trade-offs of, of parameters. Uh, right, what, what, one thing I want to, See about this table is also to motivate the last five minutes of my talk is that I want to talk about uh, what's the idea of constructing vector commitments in groups of unknown order uh, because right now are the vector commitments that give us sort of the uh, achieve the best properties like constant size parameters, constant size openings, constant size commitments, and also incremental aggregation and sub vector openings. So 
I think it's a quite uh, powerful, um, uh, I mean, construction. It turned out to be quite powerful for uh, achieving uh, all this. Before, before you go into the construction, we have a question and maybe your table uh, answer to it. Uh, yeah. Do all these constructions require a trusted setup, such as CRS or group generated by trusted party? Uh, is the trusted setup necessary, especially in post-quantum setting, uh, if one wishes for constant size opening? Uh, okay, it's a very good question, and uh, also because it's something that I was not uh, mentioning in, in my slide. So, um, uh, right, so essentially, the uh, main, most of these constructions require trusted setup. Uh, trusted setup can be avoided and uh, can be made transparent. So, what is called transparent setup, essentially, like a random string uh, as parameters. In the construction based on hidden order groups, if you essentially uh, using class groups, uh, so essentially it's these. I mean, the, yeah, the planet of hidden order group would yield uh, um, construction based on transparent setup, and uh, the of course Merkle trees and the construction of Patamantu at all from 2013. It can be instantiated uh, like um, uh, using. Uh, transparent setup because I think you, the, the public parameter can be a random matrix. Whereas the scheme based on lattices uh, by Piker requires a trusted setup. I hope this answers the question. Okay. Uh, yes, and there is another question. Yeah. Um, where does a fry based polynomial commitment uh, fit in here? Um, that's a good question. Right. Okay. Right. 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 I, actually, this is a, a good question because uh, one thing that I'm not considering this table, and I apologize because, like, the, the in some sense, the the space of construction is very vast, is very broad. Um, in part, and there is an intuition like behind the the question about Fry, and the the intuition is that any polynomial commitment is a vector commitment. Right, because you can interpolate the vector and, and use uh, uh, then uh, evaluation opening proofs to create an opening proof. Now, uh, we know a lot of polynomial commitments. I mean, some, some I mean, maybe a lot. Like we know polynomial commitments that, however, require random oracles. And I'm excluding them from here. And in particular, uh, one other reason I'm excluding them from this table is because they, are, uh, they don't have constant size. Um, openings. And the, another reason is that in general, I'm excluding another construction that would you could obtain based on non, on, uh, non falsifiable assumptions by using SNARKs. So you also by using SNARKs, you can construct vector commitment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there is a um, uh, kind of related question. We know that from any polynomial commitments, we can have a vector commitment. Uh, is it known if vector commitments also imply polynomial commitments? Um, that, okay, so there are some uh, uh, vector commitments that have so-called uh, uh, linear, so inner product openings, so-called uh, functional commitment for linear functions that uh, yield polynomial commitments. And uh, I don't know about the direct construction of polynomial commitment from any vector commitment, even though I'm just thinking that maybe the uh, Fry protocol, maybe it, it could be seen as a, something like that, but um, I'm not putting my finger on it. Okay. Right Thank you. Yeah, maybe if I, I can use uh, like a few minutes more to go and conclude my talk because I will show this table again in my last slide to discuss open problems. And yeah, maybe, okay, I, also for the sake of time, I go very fast about this um, because I think maybe people are more interested in knowing about state of the art and, and, future, uh, and future work. But so very fast. So what's the idea of constructing vector commitments in either order group? So uh, the idea is to create um, uh, like, uh, okay. So the idea is to create uh, the commitment to the vector as a sort of uh, Pedersen commitment with this basis SJ. Now, instead of adding SJ to be random group elements, um, 
So um, uh, what we do is to create uh, each SJ as the product to, as, sorry, as G, which is some fixed generator to the power of, um, okay, all the primes in a set. So you first, sorry, I didn't say this. So you have to first select N primes, E1, E2, EN, that have to be sufficiently large, like more than two to the N. Um, and then you associate each prime to position J, and then SJ is the uh, G to uh, the power of all primes except the J one. So uh, essentially this means that when you want to commit to um, this vector, this uh, product actually becomes a sum in the exponent. Uh, it's a, sorry, an inner product in the exponent of VI times TI. And uh, you can see that like in each EI, so here this column is like, uh, should be seen as a product of all these primes and they need in the ith column, the ith prime is missing. So that's the way you commit. And now this encoding allows to uh, achieve, um, you know, to make the opening constant. So the idea is that when you want to open to uh, position I, uh, first you observe that uh, if you take all the EIs, so all the EJs except the ith one, right? Uh, EI is a common factor in all of them, right? So, um, so this means that if you take now the linear combination of uh, all these E1, E2, EN except EI, right? So EI I is the position you want to open. Then the prime small EI is a divisor of this sum. And the basic idea of opening is to create a proof that EI is a divisor of this sum. And to do this, you know, making such a proof essentially comes up with the saying that if you take uh, the C and you remove SI to the VI, you can actually compute an EI root of this value. So if maybe I, I'm trying to go fast to, because we are a bit late, but uh, that's the basic idea. And you know, now the proof is a single group element and the same is for the commitment. Um, okay, well, okay. Well, the idea of verification very fast is that if this is the, um, the exponent of the uh, opening element, uh, if you raise it to the power of EI, we are kind of placing back EI in, this, uh, uh, in uh, each column, right? And then, uh, we can complete with the missing uh, element of the inner product. And that's essentially supposed to be the commitment. Okay, so I'll skip this for the sake of time. And, uh, think, uh, and I want to uh, now again discuss, uh, you know, to conclude discussing what are some open problems and uh, uh, the state of the art. Okay, so the state of the art is more or less what I showed in the, with my picture with uh, the families of uh, and the planets of vector commitments. Um, what are some open problems? And for, to look at open problems, it's interesting to also look at this table where we can see more the, also the parameters. So um, in terms of, uh, um, uh, so I mean, some interesting problem, open problems are about assumptions. So, uh, uh, until recently, we did not have many lattice-based constructions. And still, until today, uh, all the lattice-based constructions require uh, uh, like uh, both commitments and uh, opening proofs to be uh, logarithmic or polylogarithmic in the, um, uh, in the length of the vector. In my table, I'm, uh, it's true that in my table, I'm showing uh, only one instantiation of the lattice-based vector commitments. So they have actually a framework in which you can play with the parameters, but it, this is the framework where essentially you use a binary tree. Um, but I think that it's a very intriguing open problem whether it's possible to achieve um, constant size opening with lattices, if it's possible at all. And another um, interesting problem is whether we could construct vector, uh, vector commitments from uh, groups of prime order without pairing. Uh, it's, uh, we know that it's possible to do it if you use random oracles and if you go with logarithmic size proofs and the bullet proof is an example of, uh, of this. But 
not in the standard model. We, we, are, this is, we are not aware, aware of any construction. Uh, and I think uh, we are going to hear a talk by Alex uh, how this problem can be attacked in some ways. Uh, but for me, it's a very intriguing question. Uh, and then the uh, more maybe like specific question is, uh, what do we really need to obtain incremental aggregation? Because right now, the only schemes that have incremental aggregation are over groups of unknown order. Um, and I mean, the one question is, is it possible to obtain uh, like uh, incremental aggregation in prime order groups? And another open problem in prime order groups is to achieve uh, constant size public parameters. So all the schemes that have constant size parameters essentially require um, uh, require groups of unknown order or lattices. You, you can, as you can see, you can achieve it with the poly logarithmic size uh, parameters when you um, uh, you go with uh, also log n groups. And uh, another uh, problem that seems interesting to me, and uh, we have looked into it recently, um, is whether we could obtain structure preserving vector commitments. Um, and what would be interesting about them is that it would enable to obtain uh, so-called uh, you know an algebraic version of these vertical trees, like where you can commit to commitment without needing to uh, to switch uh, from uh, different algebraic structures. However, this is tends to be very hard because there is an impossibility result by um, Abe uh, um, Aralandian and uh, Okubo from 2012 that says that it's impossible to have group to group commitments that are shrinking. Um, but I think it maybe there are ways to, there may be some ways to bypass it because they were only considered the case where you start from one group and you end up with the same group. But maybe could, one could in, investigate whether it's possible to switch groups, for example. And yeah, with that, I think I like to conclude. So I hope that uh, I gave you a, a useful survey of vector commitments. Uh, there is a lot uh, more to be understood about vector commitments. Uh, there is also an exciting emerging area about functional vector commitments that I think is going to be uh, discussed much more uh, in this talk, in this in this uh, vector commitment day, and uh, uh, other speakers will talk about this. So thanks a lot for your attention. Very happy to take questions. Hey, thank you so much, Dario. That was a really nice, complete and detailed overview of the area. And I think like now we have the necessary background to understand new construction and new result that will be presented uh, today. Any questions? Comments. Okay, I think there is nothing new in the chat. So maybe because we are a little bit behind schedule, we will just move on. And thanks, Dario, again. Yeah, happy to have you. And happy for this invitation. Happy time. Thanks. <laughs>